I don't know when it started. Some people say five years ago. Other people say 25 years ago. Some people say 50 years ago. But somewhere things started to shift. Maybe we need to look at the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, where we left Roman law and order and lived in a Middle Age that lasted 700 to 1,000 years until the Renaissance occurred. I feel we're in this kind of sensibilities and I want to feel comfortable about it. And that's why I'm at the Metz Cloisters, so I can see a different Middle Age. Not our Middle Age, but a different Middle Age. Now, I don't think our Middle Age, the one we're in now, our Middle Age, is going to last for 700 years, but I don't know. And by the time it ends, well, I won't be here to be able to label it. But I thought I'd come and look at some of the things from their Middle Age to help me understand kind of the condition of what it's like to go through a Middle Age so I can enjoy this Middle Age as much as you can a Middle Age. So, let's take a look. The cloisters. The cloisters contain all sorts of art objects from the Middle Ages. From paintings, to carvings, to altar pieces, to ceramics, to tapestries. But before we really examine all this magnificent artwork, one of the nice things about going to the cloisters is you get one heck of a view of the Hudson River. Now, I think it's very appropriate that the cloisters, which I'm using kind of as a time capsule, time preparation machine for my psyche, would be next to one of the great rivers of the United States. And certainly was at the beginning because it connected uh, the Great Lakes uh, with the Erie Canal and brought uh, all the wealth from the Midwest to uh, the East Coast. So it really tied things together. Now, the river is timeless but very timeful. There's no more Erie Canal anymore. So, you know, we're gonna find some other ways to deal with things. Again, we have to be in the Middle Ages, just like when you're in the river, you're on the river. Now, the Hudson River is timeless, but does not reflect time because it's water. And you can't really do anything in water to mark time. Yes, you can add stuff like flavors, and salt and then sell it like a snake oil salesman did at the turn of the 20th century but you need something solid to record time that's why you need stones and that's what makes the cloisters the stones and these stones were made in the middle ages in europe and they have a historical sensibility this cloister building is made out of very powerful rocks. And actually they were load bearing and they came from around the world. Actually, they came from Europe. So, I mean, listen, there's no cloisters in China. We like to say around the world. I mean, it came three quarters, no, it came a quarter of the way around the world, which is not that well. I mean, it's, it's long distance, you know, now, but you know, not a big distance if you think about going to Mars. Anyway, they took a lot of care to put this together and give it a medieval feeling, as, as, as we will see, and as ha we have seen in the rooms we've, we have visited and will visit some more. Here is the Gothic chapel at the Cloisters, with stained glass windows from southern Austria from around 1340. That's old. And it contains four tomb effigies from the Urgell family. Three date from the mid 13th century and one from the 12th century. They all show these people as devout Christians, praying even in death. That must mean they felt something was coming in the future. Here is the Marode altarpiece. It depicts the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary when the Archangel Gabriel comes down and tells her she's going to have the Son of God. It's a big moment, and everyone wants to be attached to this big moment. So wealthy people in the Middle Ages had them painted into the scenery. As you can tell on the left-hand panel, this is a wealthy patron from the Middle Ages. They are often bourgeoisie from Mechlin, a town in current Belgium. The painting is packed 
with a lot of Christian iconography in hopes that all the good stuff from religion will come to them in this life, in the afterlife. The white lily represent Mary's virginity. A candle with smoke still spiraling off of it because it was recently snuffed is used to signify God's presence. And the little white body carrying a cross heads towards Mary as the presence of Jesus' body and spirit. They pack a lot into this painting because they're trying to figure out what's going on. And finally, the unicorn tapestries. When you can't figure out what's special in life, you have to invent it, and then you have to try to possess it. That's what happens in this series of seven tapestries. The group of men and women are looking for the unicorn. They hunt down the unicorn. They possess the unicorn, literally by killing it. And then they put it in a cage. Poor unicorn. But isn't it poor us for trying to possess something that doesn't exist? That's what happens when you live in an age of transition. And transition is the hallmark of being in a middle age. They even have a garden of stuff that was grown in the middle ages. Now some of the stuff is still here. Some of it's gone. This is actually a rare collection. So not only does the world change and people change, but plants change and how we feed ourselves change. And so maybe since everything's changing, you need to also have a middle-aged diet. That's something to explore later on. On first glance, people think that medieval people just ate a bunch of gruel and occasional mutton, but the diet of the people in the Middle Ages was more nuanced than that. And you can tell from these images that there was a lot more to medieval cuisine than just eating gruel. They had fancy feasts and lots of choices on their table, and they were quite skilled in cooking. Who knew that food played such an important part in medieval lifestyle? What also varied was the images and the stories of Jesus in the Middle Ages. Whether you believe he was the Son of God or not, his different images and interpretations are a vehicle for exploring faith, emotion, and morality. Here's Jesus on the cross. He's being crucified. He's going to go back to his father. But we also have a picture of Jesus as a baby eating an apple. Now that's an awfully healthy meal for a Messiah, and I appreciate that. Then again, we also have Jesus on a donkey with wheels on it. Like this is going to be pulled around to various places. And then you have the myriad of Jesus pictures with his mothers. My favorite is the side-eyed Jesus, looking rather cross. Wouldn't you be cross if you were wrapped around like that? You couldn't get your hands out or your arms? And then look at him with the donkey staring him down. Well, you know Jesus is not going to take that from a donkey, so he looks right back. When you take all these images of Jesus at once, you realize he's a work in progress. Like all of us. Like our society. And he, along with us, seems to constantly be going through his own middle age. So we should get used to the fact that transformation is the norm. So what did I learn? I'm not sure. And I think that's really what I learned. I'm not sure. That's what it's like to be in middle age, is to not be sure. They say the only thing that's constant is change. And if change is constant, then change is always changing. And that's why, if you're going to be in the middle age, like we're in the middle age, enjoy it and just be surprised. I mean, it may be a little frustrating from time to time. So you got my hair in my eyes. I've got to change. I've got to have a haircut. But I do know that I'll have my haircut, and then I will have shorter hair, and I won't get in my eyes, but then it'll happen again. So it's changing constant. Whew, I'm telling you. I don't think we'll ever end a middle age, so let's just be right in the middle of it. Thank you kindly.